Okay, hey everyone, uh, thanks for uh, coming to my talk. I uh, hope everyone had some great discussions over lunch and hope you're ready to get back into the presentation portion of the conference. Um, this talk is on the realities of D-Trace and FreeBSD. It is the experience that myself and uh, some team members of research project I'm working on have had while trying to use FreeBSD, or sorry, D-Trace on FreeBSD for um, kind of an unusual use case. Uh, this is the work of a team of people, as you can see here. This is only a subset of the entire team. It's the people that had the most uh, to do with the D-Trace portion of it. Um, I get the honor of being able to present this material on their behalf. Uh, my name is Brian Kidney. I am a software engineer. Uh, I've been a software engineer for about 15 years in various fields from radar, sonar, telecommunications, consumer electronics. Um, I did a, in the early 2000s, I did a master's in uh, computer engineering and cryptography and cryptanalysis. And uh, recently, wanting to continue on that master's but not wanting to be in such a narrow space, uh, I started a PhD in computer security. Uh, and I'm doing that under the supervision of uh, John Anderson at uh, Memorial University. And this uh, is uh, one of the projects I'm working on as part of that PhD. I am not a D-Trace expert. I've actually only been using D-Trace since the fall of 2016, but I've been fairly deep into it with my research, so um, I will answer your questions to the best of my abilities. I may uh, call upon some of my colleagues to help out if need be. We're just going to overview the presentation. Uh, I'm first going to give a brief overview of the cadets project. Then I'm going to talk about some of the improvements we've made to D-Trace just so we can get into some of the interesting stuff very early on. Uh, then I'll come back a little bit to how Cadets is using D-Trace and that will sort of uh, inform a bit of what you've heard in the previous section and the next section that I'm going to talk about which is the future improvements. The things that we've started working on um, that we're really excited about from, from the point of view of D-Trace. <coughs> So the CADETS project, um, the CADETS project, uh, CADETS stands for Causal Adaptive Distributed and Efficient Tracing System. CADETS is a project looking at tracing operating systems from a security point of view. Um, so if you look at this diagram behind me, uh, we'll start on the left hand side. We create some scripts uh, that are going to sort of probe parts of the uh, operating systems, things that we're interested in monitoring, uh, information we uh, want to, to um, gather. We plan where we're going to put those scripts. We distribute them amongst uh, a network of computers. Um, think of it, say, in a, a government organization or a company. Um, then we that instrumentation gets turned on on those machines. Uh, it's gathering data, uh, computing on some of that data, just bear trace for some. Uh, that gets sent back to a uh, central server, uh, which we can reduce the data if need be or keep it in raw format and persist it, which then goes back to the beginning of the circle again, where uh, we can analyze that data. We're using a provenance anal uh, analysis system from the University of Cambridge called Opus. Uh, we can sort of analyze the data, see what was happening on the network, see if there's anything that we're interested in, we're suspicious of, anything that maybe, oh, this tracing is not, gather it's not getting us anything, uh, but it is uh, taking up a lot of compute time. We can refine what we're doing and then go back through the cycle. So we're looking at ground up local instrumentation. Um, one of the technologies we're using is a framework called Loom, which uh, is a specified, specification driven instrumentation framework. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about more later, but it allows you to sort of define a policy file that says what you want to instrument and what you're trying to get out. And allow the framework to instrument the software for you. It leverages LLVM 
uh, specifically its uh, IR intermediate representation format um, to allow us to uh, <coughs> place in the instrumentation tracing uh, after compile time. Uh, really, what we want to get to in the future is the idea of uh, LLVM IR fat binaries that are on the system so that you have a, a binary that's sitting there that's got the, the uh, machine code compiled binary but it's also got the LLVM IR sitting next to it so that you can uh, make modifications re instrument uh, as needed. Of course, the reason you're all potentially interested in this talk is DTrace, which is a scriptable full system dynamic tracing framework. Uh, and we are using DTrace uh, for our instrumentation in the, uh, in the project right now. And it's all built on top of FreeBSD. That's the operating system that our project is concerned with. So um, how we use DTrace, as I said before, we're leveraging DTrace for security instrumentation. Uh, we're using DTrace not as a debugger as it was originally intended, but to instrument software to gather data to look for suspicious behavior. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means DTrace is now always on in our systems. Uh, as any of you who have used DTrace will know, it was designed to be turned on when you need to solve a problem, do some instrumentation, figure out what your problem was, turn it off, and it sits there in the system and does not affect performance. Uh, we're not using it as it was designed. We have it always enabled. Uh, which means uh, the DTrace protections that are built into the system can now be used against us, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Which also means we needed to make some improvements to DTrace in order to be able to use it to do what we need to do. And that's going to be the focus of this talk. It's the improvements we've made thus far, uh, the imp improvements we are proposing to make and some of the things that we're sort of in the research phase looking at. For anyone who's interested in playing with some of this stuff, uh, the Cadets Project has a GitHub repository and we have our own uh, fork of FreeBSD. Uh, most of what I will show during this talk is there, so you can go grab the code um, and compile it up and play with it yourself if you're interested. So let's start with uh, the improvements we've made to DTrace. Uh, the big ones that are there or almost there, uh, machine readable output, some changes we've made to the D language, and the new audit provider. Machine readable output. Let's see how this works. I'm going to try and switch to a console. There we go. So, oh, that was bigger earlier. Can everyone see that in the back? We're good? Okay. Uh, so this is just a standard bit um, detraced instrumentation. Uh, we're going to look at syscalls. We're specifically going to look at write and just trace the entry to write. Uh, you let that run for a bit and stop it. And this is what you get standard out of detrace. Uh, it's a column output. Uh, you get the CPU. The ID, the, the function name, colon, the entry, so they're sort of combined together. Um, our project is creating a lot of trace information, as you can expect. If we're always on, we're producing uh, in the order of meg, gigs, George, in the order of gigs information. And having an output like this is not at all convenient. Uh, one, it requires you to have a bit of an intimate knowledge of 
what the output is going to be for every probe that you call. Um, you need to start parsing this up. It's all space separated. You know, so you're writing a lot of little parsers. Um, so getting uh, the information out of D-Trace in this manner for an automated system doesn't work. So one of the improvements that we have made to D-Trace and FreeBSD is machine readable output. So I can run that very same call. Instead, I can do a minus O, JSON. That run for a second. And we get very familiar JSON output from D-Trace. Uh, this is the work of George Neville Neal. Uh, he has leveraged the libxo library uh, to allow for this to happen. Uh, and because of it, you, not, you don't just get um, JSON. Uh, for those who like to torture themselves, they can get some XML. Uh, the other use case that I, I, I first thought, I couldn't think of a use case for the HTML output. Uh, but actually, I think it might be more convenient for than uh, the XML output for me, because if you are someone who's writing a blog post about something they solved or something they're working on, you know, this is not bad for someone who wants to add it to a uh, blog post, and you can do a little bit of styling and get a really nice web page out of it. So some of the changes, I'll go back to the JSON, because that's really what we're interested in. Um, Every piece of information has a tag. So you've got your probe inside your probe. You've got your CPU that you saw on the other output. In fact, the, the first part of the output is still up there in the first couple lines. Uh, you have the ID. The function and name have now been separated to make them easier to get. You don't have to parse them apart. And there's something new there, and that's the uh, timestamp, which is nanoseconds since epoch. And, um, that was always available in uh, D-Trace, but you had to sort of ask for it. Um, and for us, it's important, especially when you're trying to do causal ordering of events. So we just put it in there. So a couple similar output. As you can see the coloring here, you can just map. Yeah, not bad. It maps together all those pieces. Uh, and it's much easier now for us to take all of this output and then just run it through other scripts to pull out what we need to analyze it. Uh, we don't need to, or not even just us, because this will be a, a system that end users will use at some point in time, we hope. Um, so they won't need to sort of run a few queries and look at the output and figure out how to write a parser and everything. They just get it right out of the box. Uh, we've made some D language uh, improvements. Um, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm not going to do too much of a, a talk about um, D trace and how it works. Uh, Arun Thomas actually gave a really good talk this morning on the internals, and if you didn't get a chance to sit on it, I suggest you watch the video when it comes out. But um, what you need to know here is D, the D-Trace language is scriptable. Uh, it uses something called the D language. Um, it's a C-like C -like language that supports all of the C operators. However, it's kind of structured like awk. Um, that comes when you, you have these predicates and stuff before you have a predicate and an action. So it looks very much awk-like for anyone who's had some experience using awk. Um, some people like it more than others. I'm actually a fan because it allows me to do some things quickly. Um, it supports uh, thread and clause local variables. So you know, I have some scoping of variables in there. And the uh, big one for uh, what I'm going to talk about here is subroutines uh, are used to handle common tasks. So Anything that you sort of want to add, add to the language that's like a printf or something like that is handled by predefined subroutines in the language. Um, so one of those subroutines that has been added is copy out mbuff. 
this allows for reading of chained M buffs in D. Uh, D trace did not ha does not have a way to read chained M buffs, and that's important in BSD because uh, the network stack uses them for data. So if you want to get any data out of the network stack, and, uh, you need to be able to read these M buffs. So that function has now been added. Well, it's in the, sorry, that function has been added to the cadets. No, sorry. That function has been added to, sorry? It's in review for FreeBSD. Uh, and it should be uh, upstreamed soon. Um, the LibXO stuff is currently in the cadets branch. Uh, I would assume that we'll be looking to upstream that over the summer. So, doing it <laughs> okay. So George is going to upstream that during the talk. So at the end of the talk, pull down the source code and see if George actually did it. Uh, without breaking anything. <laughs> okay, so here's an example of the output. Um, basically, if you're looking at a TCP input entry uh, and you want to trace the memory, now you can do a copy out mbuff to get that mbuff chain. Uh, it takes uh, a pointer to an mbuff. It takes a size of the amount of data that you want and an offset. Uh, the offset is not used in this example. Uh, it's optional. And then you can, uh, once that's copied out, you can use trace mem to just sort of dump your output. So now you can actually get the information out of the TCP stack uh, and see what you want to do there. So like, Example using the offset if you want to skip part of the headers or something like that. Um, that's available. And uh, like I said, this available soon in head. Hmm. Didn't update the title on this slide. Um, the next improvement that this is sort of a, a D language improvement that we want to make. It requires a bit more investigation. Uh, and that's if statements in the D language. D has a ternary operator, which so it'll, you know, you have this functionality there, but you get a lot of stuff like this. So if anyone wants to look at this, this is actually from one of the DTrace manuals. Uh, if you look at it long enough, you'll figure out what it's doing, because it's actually a common example you see with ternary operators. However, um, when you first look at it, your eyes glaze over, your eyes roll back, and you're like, oh, I had to figure out what this is. Uh, this is worse if you want to give this to someone that doesn't have uh, a lot of experience with uh, this sort of code, right? This is one of those barriers to entry. Um, so we would really like if statements to improve readability. Now, there's a caveat to that. There is an if statement now. There is some syntactic sugar. Actually, some, I said imported from Solaris. It's actually from Lumos. It was, um, it comes from the Lumos code. It was put into DTrace in the fall of 2016 by uh, Matthew Ahrens. Uh, and it has been ported to FreeBSD by Mark Johnson. So in this case, you can write Oh, that wasn't supposed to show up like that, but okay. You can write if statements in D right now. This is an example I took from Matthew Aaron's presentation on the work that he did. So, you know, this is a fairly complicated, well, not fairly complicated, it's just one, uh, an if else nested in an if. Uh, it's a common thing that you might want to do when you're sort of tracing through and looking for specific conditions, especially. In our research, we're looking for if, you know, uh, there's a write to this file and, uh, you know, maybe a, a, some, um, the size changed or something like that. Uh, it's a fairly common thing. You might want to do different things. With the syntactic sugar, I'll do this again. 
this is what you get. So basically what it does is it explodes the if statement into multiple um, actions uh, in your script. So the first one there is sort of setting up in case there's an error condition that can not uh, process things if the error happens. Um, if you notice, the, the bottom four that are in black are actually, all they're doing is setting up the conditionals in the if statements. The two that are in blue are what you really want it done. Uh, and the problem with this approach, as we see it, is each one of these gets run and evaluated no matter what. And if you have a fairly complicated script, it's always on. You really want the shortcut mechanisms that you get in an if statement, you know? If this is false, we won't even look inside the, the nested if. We will just skip over. But you don't get that with the syntactic sugar. Um, we, uh, so this is one of those things that um, for us will cause slow, uh, potential problems with the system. We are looking at how we can add if into the D language itself. So this is one of those ones. Uh, I placed it here because it's about the D language improvements, but it's not something that we have right now. It is something that we are actively investigating. <coughs> one of the things we do have right now is the audit provider. Uh, for those who are in the room that are not familiar with what audit is, it is a subsystem um, for logging security related events on FreeBSD. Uh, it allows you to meet government common criteria security standards. Um, I've never been exposed to these myself, but uh, government departments and contractors and whatnot have to meet certain security standards for auditing things that are happen happening on their systems so that if you know, there is a breach or maybe there's a leak or something, you can look back at the audit logs um, and see who accessed what. This could also be, you, know, you can see this being used in places where privacy is a concern. So there's a privacy breach. You can actually look back at the audit logs, see who accessed what when, and then that would help in the investigation. This has been an optional component in uh, FreeBSD since about 2004. It's a, uh, there's a kernel module and a uh, user space daemon that you have to turn on and you get all of this logging. So. The other question you might wonder, if, for those who might not be familiar, is what is a provider? Uh, Arun gave a really good uh, uh, description of this earlier. I'm just going to simplify it. Uh, it's dtrace code that provides access to a set of trace points. That's all you need to know. So it's uh, something that was written by uh, Robert Watson. And Robert has created a whole new set of trace points that allows you to get at the audit data. And what does that provider get us? Well, it gets us access to the audit framework data within DTrace uh, instead of just in the logs that are committed and written at the time. And it gets us filtering and statistics and whatever we want through the D language. So we get live access to the information now. And we can do things on the fly with it filtered out, aggregations, that sort of thing. So let's see, I can put that over there. It stayed big again this time. Okay. So I wrote a little um, script earlier. It's using the audit provider. It is wildcarding on any of the functions that start with AUE, which are, I think, all the audit provider functions start with that. And it's looking for commits. So I can just sudo uh, dtrace minus s. can run that. 
And now you see a live stream of all the audit events that are happening. And this is a, not this local machine. This is a, a virtual machine that's using one of our, uh, that's using our um, fork of uh, FreeBSD. And it's set up specifically for uh, some a demo that we're doing next month, actually. Uh, and so you can see all the commits that are happening. And you can see which uh, programs are actually doing those commits. So if you look there, most of it's dtrace. It's the main thing that's running. There's nothing else really running on the system other than SSH, because that's how I'm into the box. And so every now and then, you saw some SSH stuff happening there as well. Uh, OK, so we got a big stream of uh, audit commits. We have that in a log file somewhere as well. That maybe doesn't buy us all that much, although we do have it in the live system. Uh, I could also uh, cat that first. Uh, count the commits. Um, so let's say you're interested in just what programs are doing the most amount of commits. Well, what programs are really active in secure things you might be related security related uh, events? Okay, so sudo I'm breaking that rule that I always had to never do live demos <coughs> although they're somewhat scripted so it's a little easier uh, this one because it's doing aggregation uh, I have to stop it in order to get the numbers so I'll just stop that and so you can see on this machine um, D trace it's the main thing that's running, 103 commits in that time period. SSHD had five, and SendMail is also running on the system. Um, I didn't configure it, so I don't know what SendMail is doing there. But uh, hey, I didn't know that, so maybe I can go investigate it. So you know, this is just one of those improvements that we've made. It helps us with what we're doing, but it is upstream to FreeBSD, and anyone who is using the audit framework can now use it to sort of look live on the system, see what's happening. Okay. Quick part on cadets and dtrace, because I talked a little bit earlier about the what I'm calling the dtrace performance pitfalls. <laughs> um, it's great for everyone else. Dtrace should not degrade performance. Uh, Dtrace was built as a, a live debugging tool, <laughs> wouldn't get accepted until you could, you know, reasonably convince people that you could run this on a system and not degrade performance, not kernel panic things, uh, you know, so it's got some things in its design to help it with that. Uh, one, it'll drop records. So if the buffers fill up, it drops records. It'll just sort of ignore them. That's fine. Uh, in a debugging use case, not a big deal. Uh, the other thing is the kernel can uh, kill, tra kill tracing under a high load. Uh, so if dtrace starts to become a problem, it is possible that it could just get shut off. Now, for us, that's advantage attacker. Because if the attacker knows that this is on the systems they're trying to attack. Um, they can use these performance improvements as pitfalls for us. Flood the system first, then attack. You know, We'll just create a whole bunch of uh, things happening on the system. They're sort of innocuous. They're, they're, they don't really say what's happening. But you know, they'll get dtrace churning enough that Either we start dropping records, or maybe it gets killed totally. And once they can conceivably believe they're in that sort of state, then they can uh, start mounting their attack uh, and hope that we won't be able to see them. So the solutions to that, some of them you saw earlier, we're looking at this if statement, uh, which will allow us to sort of uh, streamline performance of some of our scripts, uh, machine readable output. Um, was all, also uh, will help us in that we're not doing a lot of parsing on the live system, that sort of thing. Um, 
Our monitoring cycle itself helps us with this in a way uh, in the live system because we do have that provenance system there. It can conceivably pick up this stuff that's not really a concern, get an idea where it's coming from, and in that whole cycle, that's when you know we'd start refining how we're scripting things. Oh wow, we're getting a lot of just results over here from um, SSH that really, well, SSH is probably not a good example because, um, you know, we're from send mail or something that just really look like high mail volumes or something. Uh, and we're not really interested in that right now, so <coughs> we'll tweak the scripts. We'll monitor that less so that we can get the other data coming through. Um, we've also done some work. Uh, George has some work uh, on buffer sizes. Uh, they were in the original D trace. They were rather small. They're now um, configurable with a, a syscuttle, uh, so that you can sort of grow the buffers and uh, you know you, so that you don't drop uh, as many records. That was a big thing when we first started using our system. Uh, you know these small buffers, we were losing things. Uh, the the, the tracing that we had doesn't totally make sense once you lose certain pieces of it. So. Buffer sizes are now configurable with uh, syscuttles. Now we're going to get into uh, the future improvements. And this is the stuff that I'm really excited about. And maybe that's because it's some of the stuff that I'm working on. Um, not that that stuff earlier wasn't exciting. It's great work. Um, I just, you know, I've spent some months uh, in the bowels of D-Trace. And uh, I'm excited to see things starting to come to fruition. A little bit of an aside, because I need to tell you about one of the technologies that we work with a little bit more, and that's Loom. It's, as I said earlier, an instrumentation uh, framework. It's based on the LLVM tool chain. We actually have opt passes for anyone who's familiar with um, LLVM. Opt passes sort of run on the bytecode before you get to the linking stages and allow you to do optimizations or other transforms on the bytecode. We use that to weave our instrumentation in to the LLVM IR. That instrumentation is defined in policy files, which uh, allows the end user to be able to use the system with less um, less intimate knowledge of how the system works and more of it. It's a YAML file format. It's actually fairly easy to work with. Um, and the instrumentation can, can be done at any time. As long as we have LLVM IR available, we can instrument it. And one of the things we're looking to do is use Loom for D-Trace probes in user space. So we want to look at what's happening in user space with a little bit more detail. Like, one of the good examples is, can I get a stack trace every time someone changes this global variable? Because this one is rather interesting to us. So every time someone changes it, we're going to dump a stack trace and see where that came from. Um, <clears throat> to do that, I first turned to DTrace's method for getting probes into uh, user land, which is the user land statically defined tracing, or USDT. And I've included here sort of a, a block level diagram of how the system works. Uh, so. You start with the provider X. So the classic example that you'll find online is a HTTP provider that was built for Apache to be able to monitor requests start and stops. Um, so you define that in a D file, D traces D language, and you run it through the D trace command line utility. Uh, the D trace command line utility is one of those command line utilities that does not sort of conform to the Unix standard of do one thing. It does everything. Uh, so with the right flags, you run that uh, 
provider through the dtrace command line utility and it gives you back provider x.h which is a set of macros that you can now put in your C code to allow you to add your, uh, in your uh, pro points. So you include that in your C file. I got app.c. Uh, one of those hard names in computer science is naming. So you got app.c. Uh, we'll include the macros. We'll put calls, we'll pepper the macros throughout the code wherever we're instrument, er, in, interested in firing probes. Uh, so then we'll compile that standard compilation process and we get app.o, just a standard uh, object file. We take that object file and we run it again through the dtrace command line utility because it does everything. And the dtrace command line utility then modifies your object where your probe calls are made. Um, I've got no ops in here because this is the classical example. FreeBSD does that a little different. It does it with uh, uh, function pointers. But so at those call sites for the probe, it, in FreeBSD it'll put function pointers and the other implementations, no ops happen. Uh, there was some discussion after the last, uh, at the, the last uh, DTrace presentation that there have been some patches made to sort of conform to the classical standards, but it doesn't really buy much and may be problematic in FreeBSD. The other thing it produces is a provider.o, which um, has this, uh, a few ELF sections. Uh, one is in the ELF and init. It uh, writes some code in the init section that allows the, um, on execution of the binary, it informs dtrace of the probes that it has. And it also has this sunw dof section, which is a dtrace object format section, which basically contains the locations of all of the probe points, which can be handed to the kernel uh, to allow the kernel to decide once the tracing is turned on, what got called where. So then you link that together uh, and you get your binary. It's a bit of an involved process. Um, some things about performance and problems. Uh, the probes are disabled when not tracing. Again, uh, it's, the probe site is either replaced with a, a no-op or a function pointer. So there should be no overhead when you're not tracing. It's when you turn on the tracing that uh, dtrace will either change the point, function pointer or in the case of the no ops, it normally does a fast trap on um, the x86 systems, it's an int3, uh, that once it gets into the dtrace kernel, it can then use the information that was handed down on the relocations to decide where you are in the code and what probe was supposed to fire. This has zero overhead theoretically. I say theoretically, uh, Bjorn Zeeb has done some looking at dtrace in the GEM5 microarchitectural simulator, uh, and he's found some odd results in that um, the original uh, dtrace uh, implementer said, you know, there's no overhead here, I just, you just put a no op, but there's some things that happen before that to save your stack and some things that happen after that to restore your stack so there is overhead that's happened there and it's a little bigger than we thought. Those are very early results now and if you're interested in what Bjorn's doing, he is giving a talk later today I believe on what he's been doing with FreeBSD and the GEM5 simulator. Problems, uh, the dtrace tool modifies your binary. It's not a big deal for some people but some of us don't like when other tools modify our binary and we're not really sure what's happening there. Um, it doesn't play well with make because there's an int intermediate step and actually getting it into the build systems I've been told uh, is problematic. Um, and for me the biggest problem was that it makes heavy use of relocations. And for those not familiar, relocations are 
for when things are dynamically loaded uh, at runtime to allow, you know, you don't know exactly where you are in the binary at compile time. So there's some calculations that has to be done in order to determine, you know, what the location is. Um, and all this happens in the linker stage. Um, and Loom works in the IR stage, which is before the linker. So I did a lot of work with it. I did a lot of investigation, but um, we never really found a way that we could uh, use Loom without looking at compiler backends, and we didn't want to do that. So what we're sort of proposing and working on is a Loom-based user land tracing. So this one's much simpler, as you can see, on four blocks now. I didn't have to go across the page. Uh, you have your app.c, and you compile it. You either get uh, an app.bco, uh, so uh, the um, bytecode object file, or you, it'll work with an app.ll, so the, LL, the .ll is uh, LLVM's um, sort of human-readable IR format. Uh, or maybe in the future we will have uh, IR fat binaries. So these binaries that have the machine code and the, uh, byte, uh, the intermediate representation are uh, together. And we can do it on any binary then. Uh, this is something that's done in the Apple world when they distribute to different systems uh, so that they can do the optimization for the system at the system. Um, <coughs> Then, any time after the compilation and build process, we can just run Loom. So it's not part of your build system anymore. It's not even something you'll see if you're not interested in instrumentation. But what we're, we want to do then with Loom is for it to take a policy, instrument the binary, and then also produce this provider x.d, which Dtrace will need in order to understand uh, the provider and what it is we instrument because this will be done on the fly. So you don't want to, we don't necessarily want a provider uh, written up front. We might want, we want the tool to define that for us and then we can just hand it to Dtrace. This is in very early stages of development. Uh, how we're actually getting rid of a lot of that linker stage relocation stuff is we have prototyped a system call called DT probe, which allows you to hand information directly into Dtrace. We have the instrumentation via Loom. Uh, I got one bug left to fix, but it's, it's almost there. There is no change to your binary when there's no instrumentation. Things we need to complete, um, performance overhead and testing. This is something we don't totally have a handle on yet, is um, the system call doing it that way, or you know, uh, what is that going to mean to system performance? So once we get to sort of at least a beer running stage, we'll do a lot of uh, testing on a cluster to sort of figure that out and refine as needed. We don't have the provider generation done yet either. So uh, that will come. And very early. Uh, even the DT probe syscall may change many times between now and any time that we're looking to upstream this into uh, FreeBSD. And of course, um, <coughs> we'll be looking for input from the FreeBSD community uh, on that uh, as we get closer to completion. Right. One more thing to talk about, and uh, this one is uh, an ongoing effort, and I think it's, it's really big and uh, could really help the entire Dtrace community. Uh, right now, the Dtrace ecosystem, as I understand it, exists like this. Illumos is sort of the core, it, it, Sun, be, uh, Solaris begot Illumos, and that's where everyone has sort of derived their uh, 
D-Trace implementation. Now, now FreeBSD took it from Solaris, but it, uh, Illumo sort of takes the placeholder of that in the world right now. Uh, and everyone sort of took from Illumos. And Illumos is doing some bug fixes right now, but not really much new development. Uh, there is some work in the community that's working uh, where FreeBSD is sort of actively now starting to work with Mac OS to exchange ideas. Apple has in the past taken um, patches from us. Uh, we are now in the uh, early, early days of taking patches from Apple as well. They're working with us to help understand the tarballs that they produce to allow us to look at the features they've added and start pulling them into FreeBSD. Uh, NetBSD, I don't know much of what's happening with FreeBSD on NetBSD. Uh, maybe someone here can tell me afterwards. Uh, I th think it was derived from Illumos. It may have come from FreeBSD, but I'm not totally sure on that. Uh, and yes, there is often the side, this. there is actually a Windows version of DTrace as well. It hasn't seen any development in like two years, but uh, it exists. I don't know if anyone's ever got it running. Um, this is kind of all over the place, and there's not a lot of collaboration, and some players are talking to others, and you know, it's, it's not really what you want to see for something that's sort of, there's a common base amongst us all. So George Neville Neal has started work on the Open DTrace project, and what the ecosystem looks like will look like, will look like as it grows, is this. Open D-Trace, an upstream for all D-Traces and all systems that exist. I may have missed some on this graph. I apologize if I did. Um, for the code that's common between each operating system, there's always going to be some piece of code that works on Mac OS and not on FreeBSD or maybe, you know, some of it will work on Windows, maybe the, the D language and the virtual machine and stuff, but not anything that talks to their operating system. But for anything that's common, the upstream is Open DTrace. That allows everyone to pull from Open DTrace to get bug fixes and new features, and everyone to contribute their new features to the, to the Open DTrace project for others to get. It's the way a community should look. The current status of this project, um, code repositories for most of the distros are in place. I think NetBSD might be, is not there yet. Um, there is some work being done to create the common upstream. As you can imagine, this is a fairly big effort to see looking at all these different uh, code bases to see who's drifted from who over time. So there's a lot of engineering effort that has to go into this, but work has started to look at common upstreams to sort of define what the open uh, D-Trace um, repository looks like in the initial stage. As this is happening, there's a bi-weekly D-Trace phone call. We've got people from FreeBSD and some of the vendors. We've got uh, Mac OS uh, people on the phone. Um, they're working on sharing what they've done and what they'd like to do. For that, a uh, requ request for discussion process has been added to the Open D-Trace repository for adding new features. Um, this is based off the joins model. Uh, so if you want a new feature, you write it up, it goes in a draft state, it's there for discussion, uh, you know, what are the impacts to the systems, uh, are there any security implementations, and then, you know, uh, you can get feedback from everyone so that everyone's on the same page as to what they're getting what they want. <clears throat> the Open DTrace uh, repository now maintains the DTrace toolkit for anyone who's used uh, for anyone who has used uh, the D-Trace toolkit, uh, it was written by Brendan Gregg. Uh, it has a lot of out-of-the-box, very useful scripts for trying to find problems on your system now. 
Uh, if you go to Brendan Gregg's website now to look for the uh, toolkit, you will see some red text that says, go to open dtrace. They're now maintaining this for me. So it's now in one place. And as part of that, that's allowed for some <coughs> uh, patches to be made to make it work on more operating systems. Because for a while, there were certain scripts that didn't work uh, just because Python's in a different directory or something. So the shebangs had to be changed and stuff. So some patches been made to allow that so it works on more of the distributions. And the other big piece of work that's happening now is a specification for the dtrace uh, intermediate format and the dtrace object format. Um, this is how the D language gets compiled and uh, the objects that uh, it resides in. It is somewhat documented in the code. The dtrace code is actually really well documented. But there's no sort of specification document that says, this is an instruction, and this is what it takes, and this is what you'll get back. And what this allows us to do, first and foremost, is better testing of the framework. You have a specification. It's much easier to test to a specification than sort of a understanding of what the code should do. Uh, it will allow us to start looking at um, new execution substrates, just-in-time compilers for the D language and stuff like that. And it will allow us to make it, make it easier just to make future extensions to language. If you understand what's there, you understand what's missing or what can be leveraged to produce what you need. <coughs> that is my presentation. I thank you very much. I will entertain any questions you have. Um, I've got one right away. With the work you're doing with the cadets project yes. is, as you mentioned, at least once, is obviously going to generate, as far as my language, a metric crap ton of data <laughs> on any system that has this enabled at runtime. What's your end goal for me as a sysadmin to actually make sense of that data? So, um, The consumer of this system right now is maybe not the average sysadmin. <laughs> We're looking at the sort of the advanced persistent threat problem. We're looking at, this is a, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, this is a DARPA project. It's part of a bigger project uh, called Transparent Computing, which is the idea is to make operating systems more transparent as to what's happening on them so we can understand what's happening in our systems. So we're looking at sort of the nation state level attacker who is going to sort of attack your system over a long period of time, not script kiddies. We're looking at someone who's going to come into your system, maybe sit there for months after they've gotten in through some sort of spear phishing or something then start to probe the system to figure out where things are, lateral movement throughout the network, before maybe even a year later they start exfiltrating data. Um, think some of the things that happened in the United States last year. Um, so in these cases, that amount of data is not necessarily a problem for them because they need that visibility. So. Um, okay. You just Sorry. said that so this is supposed to be used by advanced persistent threat operators. No, 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 no. Sorry, to, 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 sorry to detect. At, uh, sorry. Arun, you want? I'll add Arun.
Okay, sorry. Thanks, Arun. <laughs> Anyone else have any more questions? I got a couple more minutes. Go here and then there. Uh, no, as I understand. So at the moment, it's all of the integral values, and you know, basically any probe will come out that way, as well as stack traces. Um, so the aggregations have not been turned into a machine readable format yet because I looked at it and then I went and looked at something else, and then I'll get back and look at it. Yeah, again. and <laughs> things like <laughs> trace that <laughs> the <laughs> when you're printing out. The, Excellent. So if you're looking to mitigate as machines, presumably you have to be very stealthy about what you're auditing and logging. If, you, if I notice that your auditing is not going to execute, um, go attack a different machine um, to launch from. So are you looking at sending all the audit data you know, off via network to some other database? This is another one I'm going to hand off to a room. I think I've got time for one more question. Colin? Uh, if you're worried about data being exfiltrated to systems, uh, have you looked at whether it would be possible for people to use your auditing log as a covert channel to exfiltrate data? <laughs> the short answer is no, we haven't looked at it yet. Um, With that, my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. If everyone could put some feedback in the speaker thing, this is my first time talking here at BSDCAN, I would really appreciate some constructive feedback. Thank you very much. Sure.